So thank you for meeting me this Friday morning at happy hour. For those not in the know, my name is Rashad Bowtie Mills, but for this particular episode, I don't have on my signature piece, which is the bow tie, uh, but I am here nonetheless. I'm incredibly excited to have my guest, whom I will introduce momentarily. So you can always follow the show via following me uh, via YouTube and Spotify. Every new episode will upload there on Friday mornings. One of the things that I also do is I'm looking to expand. So this podcast will be on other platforms. So if you're first time listening to the platform, one of the things that you may be asking yourself, how did I come up with the name Meet Me at Happy Hour? For those that are not in the know, I struggled with alcoholism for years, and I decided, as opposed to being at somebody's bar at 5 p.m., throwing back shots of Hennessy, that happy hour, I decided to turn things around for the good, and at 5 a.m., have people meet me at this happy hour, where I am bringing on people that are uh, they're movers and shakers, whether it's in the Baltimore community, whether it's in the worldwide community, the global community, they are doing things that... I consider that make me happy and make others happy, and they are bringing positive energy to the world. So that's how I arrived here. And so my guest today, um, I actually met this young lady before I introduced her. I actually met this young lady. I was uh, doing a keynote speech at a high school, excuse me, a middle school graduation. Her son was one of the graduates there. Congratulations, by the way. And afterwards, we just had a phenomenal conversation in the parking lot of all places, but good energy always will find itself to good energy. And I begin to see some of the extraordinary work that she's doing in not only Baltimore, but certainly on a worldwide level. And I wanted to bring her on and kind of share uh, with people that are listening that decided to meet me at happy hour. So Teresa Davis, thank you so much for meeting me at happy hour. Teresa is a film director. She's a five-time author. A visionary is one of the words that I got out of your bio, an actor, and just one of those all around positive movers and shakers. So, Teresa, thank you so much for meeting me at Happy Hour. How are you on this rainy Friday afternoon? Well, hello. That introduction to you is awesome. <laughs> is that me talking about you saying so? That's, that's, that's all you. Thank you. I love how you said that. I, whoa. Um, I'm excited to be here. And it was awesome to meet you. And how we met is unforgettable. It's very yes. pivotal for me. It was my grandson, in fact, um, that graduated. And um, that was my son that was there, my son's son. So it's a generation of love. And um, it's a great day to have met you. And I won't forget you for that day. You you touched everyone, including myself, with your words. You did. Well, listen, I, I appreciate you so much um, just for the kind words that you shared with me. But also you have touched me, right? And you have touched me because you have positive energy and you're taking that positive energy and you're channeling that into positive things and where others can benefit. So I use the term visionary. I use the term author to describe you, film director, actor. Thank Are you. any of those terms ones that you would like to identify with more as opposed to another because you have so many things going on? No, no. Um, when people greet me sometimes, I, I forget what I do, like what you just did. I, I just, to hear someone else say it is it's phenomenal. You know, because I, I just do it with ease because I like doing it. So it's like I'm not working that hard. I'm just doing what I love to do. <laughs> and so when I hear it, it's like, oh, okay, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> that feels good. So so let me ask you this. How did you get started um, in the field of entertainment? Like, what was your introduction to it? Like, what was the thing that sort of grabbed you and you said, this is a love of mine that I want to pursue for a long time? Oh, wow. I was, um, well, well, first of all, I'm surrounded um, by uh, people who are talented. My family uh, was very talented. And um, I would think I was like six or seven. And we used to put, my siblings and I, we used to put on these shows in the backyard. You know, like little dance shows and acting and stuff like that. And, you know, we had, my brother was very musical. My sister was musical. They both played instruments. I once played the trumpet, but they played guitars. And we we used to hustle for money. We always work hard. And so hustle was in my blood. Hustle could be anything. You know that. So um, we, we charged a quarter to get in. And I knew then, I like this. I like performing. And the quarters just added up and added up. But we had one friend of ours. She lived right across from us. And she could look down into our yard. And so I remember I was like, oh, she's stealing because she didn't pay us a quarter. She's watching from her, up in her window down into our yard. 
And so I created this tent effect like you would at the circus. And my brother was like, yeah, so you got to pay to get in here, you know? And that that was like the start of it. And then um, in school, I would write. And um, I would write plays in school. But I don't really like doing plays. It's, uh, for me, I like writing stuff like that. But it's a lot of work doing plays. People don't want to come to rehearsal. And rehearsal can be long. And people might not show up when the day comes. And people have to know the lines. And I, I pretty much like directing acting because it's it's like it's a staple. When you finish, it's a cut, it's a wrap, and that's it. But um, with that type of performance, with the live performances, uh, it's more you need them there. And they don't come, they let you down, and things like that. It's a lot more work that goes into it. Can you remember? Can you take me back to your your first performance, like oh, your your God. very your very first performance? Like what what was that? What was that like for you? My first performance, I wasn't scared. I was excited. I think I was, um, I may have been five or six. Um, I was on a show on TV called Romper Room. I don't know if you remember that. Yes. You were on Romper Room? Yes. Oh, yes. wow. Okay. People don't know that. You're the first person to ask me that question. People don't know that. I almost forgot. You just jogged my memory. I was on Romper Room and uh, that was fun for me. I I didn't know it was that much work in going to uh, into a commercial. It was more like a commercial type setting, mm -hmm. but it, it was a show though. But it was shot like like how you do commercials. And I was like, "This is hard work," but I liked it. I liked it, you know, mm -hmm. for a small child to be told, "Do this again, do that again." It's, you know, it was mechanical, but it was fun because we had to sing a song that they made, and uh, we had to learn the song and we had to sing that. So that was one of my first shows. And then I was on UPN twenty four for um, later years later for uh, talent. I, I'm a spoken word as well. I'm sorry it's not in my, my bio. I I don't know. It's so much stuff that I've done. I, I, I don't have it all in there and I got to work on that. But I'm also a spoken word artist too. So yeah, I was on TV for that. So you, you have this first performance, right? As a child, as you continue to grow and grow and grow, like what was the thing that just kept you in this this sort of space of acting, directing and writing? Like, what was the, is there a word that sort of describes the thing that just kept you sort of in love with it? Um, you get to be other places. Like, I'll share a really short story with you. When we were in school, um, my teacher, I'm from I'm from the inner city. I'm from um, Preston Street, Passon Park. It's, a, it's urban. That's a, yeah, I, I, I was born in, in the east side of Baltimore. That's where I'm from. Um, but we had a little small stint in the project, which was, um, I was from Douglas Court at one point and we moved from there. My mother, she she saw fit that we moved from there. At the time, I didn't know. I was like, I want to stay with my friends and what have you. But we moved to Preston and Patterson Park. And my teacher at my high school used to always say, when you come back from summer vacation, you do an essay. And, you know, writing was my favorite thing. You do an essay and things like that of that nature. And she she started not believing me what I used to write. And I, I could tell she was like skeptical. And then she was like, you went there because you, you you nailed it in the nose. You sure you went there? I was like, yeah. My mom worked so hard. My dad, I was raised by a stepdad. I had my real father as well, my biological father as well. But my stepdad was more um, of an intricate uh, a point in our lives. And he took us everywhere. He was from the service as well well diverse he's been everywhere he had like three or four jobs that's why i get that from and they both had a lot of jobs and they were all meaningful and he took us everywhere so when i wrote these stories she used to somewhat i want to say challenge me and and then when my mom came up because she worked there too sometimes at the school my dad worked for the board of education as well as one of his jobs he had and they would ask them about the trip she would ask them like she was reiterating or checking and they're like oh yeah we went there we went here and She's like, oh, because it was so clear and vivid. And that's when I knew that I could tell a story and I could write and I could en envelop people. I knew that. Mm. So, you know what? You, you have these experiences when you're young, you, you fall in love with it. What was like that first, um, whether it was a movie, whether it was a play that you said, you know what? Like, I, I've kind of arrived. Like, what was that, that, first, that first sort of major... <laughs> role or, or movie and you said you know what I, I've arrived with this one it, it would be my my first novel which was um Ghetto Misery Uncut 
Ghetto Mystery Uncut was about um, in the city, uh, this guy, he, he was married and he had a set of twins and they were drug dealers in Baltimore. It was all fictitious, but it was a story that I made up and, 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 and their children um, watched how they moved and watched how they did business. It wasn't the drug dealing of it all. I believe if you're going to write about drug dealing, this is, my, this is my point of view. If you're going to write about drug dealing, car, no car, niche, things like that, that you have to teach within it. That's what I like to do. That's probably a big difference from other writers and other film screen play writers. I write about substance, but I'm going to use the cardinal stuff to draw you in. Mm -hmm. So um, that book was really good, how the twins had watched their parents and the parents got older and the twins had, um, in the part two, which is Street Landlords, you can get all these books on Kindle or your Amazon. Um they emulated them. They 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 loved them. They idled them, and and their their parents were upset. And the book tells you how things change, and when you do things in front of your children. But I show you all the stuff, though, all the carded things and all the dark stuff, and then I show you some pivotal changes and things like that. I write about recovery a lot, and it's funny you said something about um, you know the alcohol and things like that. I write about that kind of stuff because I, I like to write about what we need to heal from. And I like to hide it and stuff, if that makes sense. So I, I love what you just said, Teresa. It's um, you will draw the reader or, you you know, you draw the, the audience member in with the carnal stuff, but there's lessons behind it. Um, so I, I guess my next question is every time that you, you know, you write a story, you direct something. Is there positive messaging behind it? Oh, yeah. Full circle. Um I, I kind of write, like, if you ever saw the movie, I got a little cold. Um, it was cold last night. It was chilly. Uh, excuse me. If you ever saw the movie Pulp Fiction. Yes, absolutely. You saw all the interchangeable things, all three stories, and they all came together at the end. Mm -hmm. that, that's my style of writing. So I'll take you on a long journey, but somehow those characters intertwine. And it's like, oh... But during that journey, like I'll tell you, I'm I'm doing a movie called Kicking Indoors at this point. And yes, uh, we're gonna talk about that. Yep. Yes, so many people are in it. Um, that structure that I use for that movie, um, all roads lead to the middle. Recovery, jail. I cover all of that. Healing, overdose, that type of stuff. Did that make sense? No, it, it made it. It made a lot of sense. Um, let, let's kind of stay here for a second, right? The, the mm -hmm. movement that art in, often imitates life. Sort of the the roles that you have played in movies, um, the movies that you have been, the scripts that you write. Is it easier to kind of write about them because there's been probably a lot of experiences around you just sort of growing up in Baltimore? Has that made that kind of writing a little bit easier? Because again, we know the climate and the culture of Baltimore. Second nature, yes. I I, I can look out my window, um, you know, the eyes of the window to the soul. So I can sit on my front steps. I remember being, I was punished one time because uh. I had a little fast tongue. My mother, we, we still had to say, yes, ma'am, no, sir, as opposed to the youth that we see, some of the youth, not all of them today. Um, I can't say all of them because um, I, I met some really good people working with kids and my grandkids, and they're well-respected. Um, when I was little, I was punished, and my mom was like, you could be mad at me, but you're going to say good morning, and you're going to say hello, and you're going to say good morning. Mm -hmm. So this day, I was like, I'm not going to talk to her. I'm just not gonna do it. And so she punished me. So I was sitting on our steps. We had the marble steps. You remember those? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sitting there and I'm looking at so many things happening beside me, in front of me. Um, the park across the street was like just, it was just, it reminded me of something of the, uh, New Jack City, the way they would line up and they would, they would go to the hole, they call it, and just get. Everybody's lying to get served, and I'm sitting there. I mean, you imagine I'm a young child, and I'm I, I I'm sitting there looking, and I'm like, wow, and I began to cry. Because it was just hurt, it was heart wrenching to, mm -hmm. to watch. And I started writing 
I, I, my one of my friends gave me a book called uh, Dope Fiend. It was Donald Goins. I don't know if you know the writer Donald Goins. And a lot of people they they compare me to Donald Goins. To me, that's uh, electrifying. <laughs> I don't know, like his speech was. Mm -hmm. his, his speech was electrifying. And uh, you're welcome. I just get so filled up about it because it's my quest. You know, it's what I was I was born to do. I don't know why. I can't explain it, but um, after the lady gave me the book, my friend, her name was Tasha. She's so cool. She gave me the book. I just took off reading all the urban books he wrote. He wrote 18 books under the name of A.C. Clark and a couple other names. But um, Donald Goins was my favorite writer. Rest in peace to Donald Goins. He was slain and murdered in, um, I think it was the late uh, 1960s, I think it was, something like that, because I was born in 68. And I just fell in love with his writing and I could I could relate to his writing. And then when I look, I had a neighbor, you know, and I look and I didn't know what drugs was back then, but then I started noticing you learn fast. These kids gonna learn faster than we think. And I just felt sorry for that person. I just felt empathy. I don't like to use the word sorry, so I'm sorry for saying that. I apologize. But empathy. I felt empathy. I was just sympathetic and they were sick. I, I knew then, oh, this person is sick. And then as time went on, the older I got, I saw family members that I, I, I recognized that in. And I was like, oh, okay. And I had um, a real close family member who was on drugs. And um, we, we battled that together as a family. So, and I lost a, a nephew to, to opiate uh, use. Mm, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> so when you, when you write or when you come up with a script, it almost feels like that you are writing from your own reality and your your own your own experiences. Mm -hmm. I guess let me ask this question, and this is the therapist in me. How hard for that, or how hard is that, I should say, for you to do that? Like, do you, oh. do you have to go to a different place to to write to it? It's easy to write it because um, I don't write about those individuals. I haven't. Um, wrote about those individuals. It's just uh, it's things that happen in life and things that I create. I, I am I do a lot of fiction too, but it comes from a place of healing. Comes from a place of hurt. Now to write uh, actually my my family or my people um, story, I I haven't done that. I, the closest I've done to that is um, touching bases um, in the movie Kicking in Doors. Uh, 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 there's a little boy. There's a little girl. Uh, she she passed away from opiate use. She was she OD, and um, for my nephew, I put her in place of my nephew. But it's not his story. But I put I put her in place of him. And and it, this is a fun story. It's a fun story. It's a fun fact that his mother, my nephew's mother, um, I asked her, "Will she come play the little girl's mother?" And she said, um, "Tell me more about it." And I, I told her about it. And I told her that a lot of the story was some part connected to what my nephew went through, but not actually his story. Um, this person was thrown in the alley and my nephew's story is opposite of that. But, and she said, you know what? I, I think I would love to come do that. And it would it would make me feel better to, to, to speak out mm. um, about her son and to speak out, which is my nephew, um, to speak out about what the Baltimore, um, what the police didn't do and what they should have done, which we need to talk about more because we need to address this as a sickness and we need to address it as not so much as a crime, if you will. That's another story, but their healing needs to be done. You can relate to that, I'm sure, as a therapist. Gotcha. Absolutely. Now, let's talk about this kicking in the doors. Kind of tell me a little more. Uh, about that, um, the basis behind that, and your specific role in that. Hmm. <laughs> oh my God, it's a lot. Um, I sat down and I just wrote this phenomenal story about Baltimore. Um, I I filmed a lot of things here in Baltimore. If you follow my pages and stuff like that, things that I was a radio host for three and a half years. I had um, I had a show called Teresa Davis Speaks, and you listen. And I talked to a lot of people in Baltimore. It was a lot of people like music producers, actors, um, some some political people, 
um, all types of facets of people who I spoke with. And I touched bases about Baltimore. So I was able to film a lot of stuff about Baltimore, even the Fetty Gray situation. Um, a lot of unrest here in Baltimore I was able to cover. I, 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 I film alongside Channel 11, Channel 2, Channel 45 um, often and during that time frame. And it just was a lot of things happening in Baltimore. There's a lot of things happening here. And it's, it's um, a lot of unrest, you know, even with the um, Tyrone West situation that still goes about every Wednesday. Um, people want, people want solutions. They want answers. They want, um, they just want to be understood and heard that they're upset. And so some of those stories became my stories in, inside of Kicking Indoors, if that makes sense for you. Okay. So Kicking Indoors specifically, so the, the stories that will be, is it, this is a movie format? Uh, yeah, it'll be a series. Um, I started writing it two years ago in the height of the COVID situation. Um, I was like, well, I'm in the house. What do I do? I've written five books and I've also written another five that aren't published just yet. And so I was like, you know what? I'll do a screenplay, but I have to wait to, to film it. So I wrote it. And then as uh, another year we started coming out, you know, things started opening back up. Um, I, I did the COVID set test. I took that test so that we were able to film again. And I got out there, I started filming. I wanted to do some political stuff like um, with the mayor. He played, he portrays himself the 51st mayor. That was Jack Young. And he plays himself. And I wanted to talk about the relationships with police and the relationships with citizens and not not your gang members, but just citizens, mostly the citizens, how they interact. And then I started adding in some of the culprits and things like that. So you see how that happens when we knock in their door. Each door has something different. Each house is something different, whether it be getting locked up for dogs or getting locked up for drugs or getting locked up for, um, I don't know, lots of, I can't tell you all the story, but getting locked up for different situations. And the way I, 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 I formulated it was that I, I got kind of tired of waiting for like main characters and sometimes they'd be, they'd be on their best behavior. Like, Oh, I'm not coming. And Oh, you need me. They have that persona after they get this big role. Sometimes, not all of them, but sometimes. And I was like, you know what? I'm ready to work. I'm ready to, I'm just, I, I, I love to put my work in. I said, I'm going to write something where I can change each scenario every week. There's a different scenario on the show. So now I'm not bound to that character. I'm not tied to that character. I'm not so emotionally uh, attuned to that character. I can create more characters. And then I stayed on the police officers where we do a backdrop of their of their background and what they are. Because I'm one of the I'm one of the police officers. I play a um, corporal. My name is Corporal Shocker on the movie. So um I didn't write to play in it at first, but I I got tired of chasing people. So I said, you know, I'm not gonna let me down. So I do have one of the big roles on the show. And then my son, he plays a music producer um who is a slash um, drug dealer. And what I wanted to do with the music in Baltimore was show it's so many people that I had on my show years ago and I, I kept in contact and we, it's just so many artists and rappers. And I was like, you know what? I want to plat show a platform of them in the city. So my show is sort of like, if you were to go back to Empire, when they started, they had the music and they had the drama. Mm -hmm. well, I got a lot of music in between the political and the police, things like that. I got a lot of music. So the premise is that the rappers are battling for, a certain amount of money. And so I have different platforms and different types of rappers, singers, artists throughout the city that I think should be highlighted that I think are awesome in Baltimore. So mm. that's how I was able to do that. Mm. Why do you think it's so important to actually tell the story of the everyday Baltimore resident through media and you sort of control the narrative? Why do you think that's important? Oh, it's, it's extremely important that we tell our own stories and our own narrative and our own point of view. Um, I remember, uh, God bless his soul, Tyree uh, Coleon, you know, um, he had a lot of things, you know, mental illness going on, but he was a good guy. He actually played in one of my movies. And, you know, it, it's a shame that he had to, to, to leave here that way. It was a cry for help plenty of times, but um, 
one day they had an unrest and it was um the little boy scooter if you remember the little young guy in town the young guy scooter mm-hmm. and he died um and i followed that story for a long time and um uh, tyree was on pennsylvania avenue and it was a big big rally big Lots of kids, lots of people, but it was an unrest. It truly was. They had a sniper out there. I had never been in that situation, and I was filming it. I was filming it along Channel 11 and um, 13, and I will never forget this day, like the day I met you at the parking lot. And someone said, how you met him? I'm always going to remember that. Um, I will never forget this day because uh, Channel 11, um, they asked, the Black people was upset. It was a lot of black people there, and they felt like what you just posed to me the question about your narrative and t- you know, telling your story. They felt like they wanted Channel 11 and the other news stations to leave. And my partner, Kane, uh, what well, we called him, Kane Cole, but his name is Leonard Coleman, we were filming with our cameras, and they said, We want those news people to leave. And they were rallying, and they was all upset. Everybody was throwing bottles, and, and I'm like, Oh, God, do I leave? I'm saying, Oh, my God, this is crazy. And I never forget. Um, I forget her name, Jane something. She's retired now. And they asked her. Yeah, they asked her to leave. She was livid. Uh, every time she saw me, she she's like, oh, that's that lady Teresa. And I was like, how you doing? And I would get a flat high. But I mean, we we're going to tell our own stories. And so they asked her to leave. They left and we filmed it. And it was, it calmed down. I remember um, Melvin, Major Russell at the time, uh, before he stepped down. He was there talking people down. He's a phenomenal guy, Mr. Russell is. He also plays in Kicking Indoors. He's a pastor now. I don't know if a lot of people know. He's a he's a he's an awesome pastor. Pastor, and he he at the time he was um, the acting um, um, police commissioner at the time. I think he was, and he he got everybody to stand down, and it was it was surreal. And I was thinking about what my parents probably went through because they marched for Martin Luther King, and um. I was thinking like that. I, this was scary, but this is something we had to do. And so I filmed everything, and my partner Leonard Coleman, we filmed everything. And um, Tyree was able to talk down a lot of people. They they related to him. A lot of street people, um, you might want to say thug people, with different people, different dialects, different type of people, and they they stood down. And I never forget that day. So we 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 do need to tell our own story, and I've been beside the news. I don't want to say which ones, but I've been beside the news, and I and I watched the news later, and I said that wasn't what I filmed, that wasn't what I saw. So I've seen the the tweaking of the narrative, if you will. Mm, that that's really important, um, Teresa, to talk about the narrative from the mainstream media perspective. And then somebody like yourself that's really like bootstraps on the ground. You're in the community. You know the movers and shakers. And to get that perspective. Here's another question. From an individual like yourself, just like me, you know, growing up in Baltimore, um, do you feel additional pressure to make sure that the outside world doesn't always see this narrative of Baltimore and sort of change the perspective of Baltimore through literally through your lens, no pun intended, so people can see that, yeah, we're a different Baltimore than we're often portrayed at. I love that question, Rashad. I don't feel pressure. Mm. I what I what I what I do is I know who I am. I know what I'm capable of and I know my worth and people don't play with me and I don't play with people. I am a person who shows adamant respect and I want respect back. I give more respect than I receive. That's going to happen in life. If you're a mature adult, you're going to know that. I give more respect than I receive and I'm not going to change our narrative. I'm not going to dumb it down for lack of words for these kids. I'm not. I travel a lot. They say, well, was Baltimore really like that? I say, like what? Like what? So my lens is going to let them peer into what we do. And some of it is not as pretty as we would like for it to be, but it's our truth. It's our narrative. It's our real. So when I write something, it may be shocking. It, it, it may be prolific. It may be profound. It's where I'm from. It's what I am. It's what I'm made of. 
I'm not going to dumb down anything for these people and I'm not going to change anything. I really, really like that perspective. I really like that perspective because, um, number one, I'm glad that you don't have any pressure, right? Because that, again, that's that's who you that's who you are. It's naturally a part of you and the in the gifts and talents and ability that you have to show up with with the camera or to write and to make this um, pretty challenging thing, right? A lot of times you bring light out of it, right? Uh -huh. And I'm glad that you answered it in that way, because I think sometimes people want us as Baltimoreans to when we go abroad and when we travel to say, no, Baltimore isn't really like that. It really is. But however, there's still beauty in it. There's so, so much beauty, of beauty, right? There's so much beauty in it. And I'm glad that you answered it that way. Here's one of the things that I, that I want to ask you about. Do you think Baltimore gets enough credit? for the immense level of talent in terms of writers and film that that it's here and it's born and bred from Baltimore. Do you think they get enough credit for that? And if so, why? No, no, we don't. Um, there are so many talented people here that it's scary. It's scary, like to see someone playing drums on a bucket and sounds so wonderful, to see someone uh, recite a poem on the side of the street, see someone playing uh, acoustic guitar, to see someone in the studio. That's what I want to do with this movie. I got so many women and so many men that are rapping and that don't get the just do because they're not popular. Popularity is overrated. How someone dresses, how someone looks, how someone has all this jewelry on, how they, uh, in this click, that click, they take away from the creativity and it, 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 it just burns my soul. There are so many talented people here in Baltimore. And then um, people come here and they are starry eyed. Like when people talk about LA back in the day, I'm going to LA. I'm going to get on the bus, a one way ticket. And this is it right here. This is where you should be doing that at. Baltimore's explosive. And I mean in a good way. We just have to get in front of our children and in front of our young adults. We have to get, we have to, we, we probably can't save most of the older people. They're set in their ways. We got there, but we can save these children and we can direct them through art, through film, through, through language, through laughter, you know, nostalgia. And I don't like how school was taken away. This is off subject, but taking away our history and our nostalgia and our, you know, things we've done and taking away the history, just marking it out the books. It is our job as parents to teach our children. My dad poured into me, my, 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 my stepdad, that's my dad. He poured into me, poured into my sister, he poured into my brother. We went everywhere to see where he would, where he was abroad. We, we visited plenty of those places. Mm. When I was a little girl, he's like, he's from Winston-Salem. And there's this big, great, huge uh, teapot in the middle of town. And he took me down there and he couldn't find it at first. He got flushed and upset. And Omar was like, it's just a teapot. He said, no, it's not. It's history. And he found that teapot. And it was huge to me because I was a little girl, of course. I was like, it's a big teapot. This teapot was huge and it was tilted a little bit. But it was the point that it was his history. He wanted me to see it. We mm. can't allow people to steal from us. We can't. Writing, typing, books, even audio, audio books, clips, clippings, newspapers. You can't take away history. You can't undo it. And people will ask me, what takes you so long with your project? First of all, we can't rush history. Mm. I'm not going to rush a project just so you can see yourself. You can look in the mirror and see what you think you see, but do you see yourself? But we're not going to rush a project just so you can say, look, my no hands. That's, that's me right there. No, I, I wait for I wait for history. As with um, the mayor, the former mayor. You know, once the mayor, always the mayor. Uh, 51st mayor, Jack Young. Um, he, he didn't really, I don't think he put a lot into to the next race. So he didn't win. Um, he, like you say, he was appointed to do that um, at that time. And he did his, I think it was nine months. So don't, don't quote me. But um, he did that. He did a good enough job, I think. He made it through. He unscathed without being tarnished. 
You know what I'm talking about? Because a mm-hmm. lot of politics, you can't leave without getting locked up. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's hilarious. But um, yeah, he did his thing. And history. Um, then came um, our mayor that we have it now. Uh, uh, what's the young boy name? Um, Scott. Scott. Yeah, this is Scott. And um, I met him too. He was nice. And he had to take place. So in my movie, we change. We pass the baton. Those things had to happen. The history had to be made first. People died. You know, people died. Um, injustice was done. Those stories had to happen first before I could even imitate or emulate some of those stories. You can't make history happen overnight. So as I'm waiting, as I'm being obedient, because I'm a real spiritual person, as I'm being obedient, as my God tells me what to do, as I'm listening to the to, to his demands and this is what you should do. And I'm 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 listening like like the water's riffling. Just I'm just everyone's ruffled. How long are you gonna be? And I'm just listening. And he's like, You wait, my child, and I wait for certain things and I, the things that I've got, Rashad. Mm. I, I couldn't have rushed it. I couldn't have rushed it. Because it's, it's so powerful once you actually wait, right? Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you this. So kicking indoors, so the individual stories that you have collected where people are actually telling, telling their, you're telling somebody else's story, right? I know you had mentioned that a part of it is the um, the pharmaceutical part, right? Let's, let's call it what it is. Um, the pharmaceutical part are we talking about um, AKA the street drugs that have been so detrimental and challenging to people of Baltimore? Why did you feel so compelled to talk about that angle of it? Oh, that's my quest. Everything I write. I have some other stories that are touch pieces. Um, I talk about uh, molestation. Um, Some of those stories on YouTube, I talk about um, um, people without, love who don't know how to love so some of those are touch pieces um i'm always going to talk about recovery because we're always going to be hurting it's not just the the person or the addict himself it's the people who are uh, people family members who are their foundation people who who are their sponsors is those people that need help too um i've always i didn't know that i was a sponsor my brother said you know yeah you know, you, you you sponsor, you sponsor me. And I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> I'm talking about, I was a young girl. And he was like, you know, because he always came to me. We always talked. We always shared dear things. And I didn't know. And I used to go to all the meetings with him. And he used to be in the meetings up, up in um, Philadelphia, a place called Recovery King. A lot of people go there from Baltimore. And they welcomed me to come because a lot of times, you know, they don't want to break their anonymity. And and he said, it's my sister. She's staying the weekend. You mind if she sit in? And, and then they just start letting me come, you know, a lot. And um, a lot of them gave me interviews. At this time, I wasn't a radio host, but I was um, I was going around, like, out and about just getting stories. And they gave me some touching stories. And it was it was heartbreaking. The one guy, i never forget this, he told me, you, you say you want to hear this story, but I don't think you want to hear this story. And I, I, I told him, I said, well, I want to hear, you know, I'm so wet behind the ears and and his story broke my heart. I couldn't sleep for weeks. His story was so, you know, I, I wrote about it, but I, I changed a lot of things. I told my word. I changed so much stuff in it, but they go through a lot. And so this is this is my quest. It's like, uh, remember that movie Johnny Quest? <laughs> he ran around, it was his quest. It's my quest to help people. My quest to tell people and to educate and to um, just make you think. Why, why is it so important uh, for you to to write? Um, well, let me phrase the question this way. Do you feel that with the younger generation like that, that's coming behind you, right? The younger people growing up in Baltimore. Do you think it's really important for them to know other authors and to see other authors? Because one of the things that I always said when I was a young person growing up I couldn't relate to writing a book because I never met an author, right? Oh. And then when I got older and I was able to meet authors, I'm like, wow, it, it sort of, it, it changes, it changes the mentality. Oh, I met an author. Now I can feel inspired to, to sort of write a book. So like, I guess kind of tell me your, your thoughts on that, just sharing 
um, so much of what you do through written word and letting young people like see that, that being an author and telling your story and having control over it, how important that is. Oh, it's super important because, um, you know, like you say, art imitates life and, mm -hmm. and writing is, is a form of healing. So, and uh, so just with reading. So you want to write your stories down. You want to write your accountants. You want to write what you thought, what you felt. You know, your life becomes a journal when you start pouring out. It doesn't have to always be true. Sometimes you can write. I write a lot of things that aren't true, but I write true instances where this instance, this may happen. If you do this, this will happen. If you, I'll give you a story. One of my own stories. So when it's one of my books I write, um, I write for all ages though. It's not just for the youth. It's for all ages. And anybody can walk away with something like like your your speech. It, it just wasn't for those, those, those young adults, those young teenagers to be. It was for their parents too. It was for the grandmas. It was for the great grandmas sitting there. The lady next to me from Virginia who mm. was standing up clapping for you. You you touched her. She she moved here to give her children a better life. And her child, I met her there. Her child had autism. And um, he was labeled with autism. And she refused to accept that. She refused. Mm -hmm. And he's graduating. You're speaking to him. And she shared that story with me. <laughs> I tell you. And, and you brought that out of her for her to tell me. She said, that's right. Because see him? She pointed to him. He's a handsome little boy, too. And he knows my son, my grandson. They play together. He's super smart. You know that. Mm -hmm. Heightened sentence. You know, things are different for them. I have a nephew who has autism. And that would be the one, a great nephew that was the one that died son. He left him behind and he mm -hmm. has autism and he's super smart. So, so, so she shared a story because you brought that out of her by your speech. She, she said that came here for a better life for them, but it was hard. And um, in between, she was talking to me and it, it, it made me feel something because um, some of the kids were mean to him. They didn't. They don't know what that is that he has. They didn't mm -hmm. understand he has a disability, and, and they made it tough for him. But he per persevered. She has another child who graduated from college with honors, and she was leaving there early to go meet that child. So pushing is everything. And I tell people, you're going to write a story. Somebody just text me. I want to write a story. Then you should be writing and not texting me. Have you started? No. Are you going to start? I don't. I don't know where to start. I said at, at point one at the beginning. Well, how often should I write? Every time your heart desires. Mm. Well, what do I do with it? Don't worry about it. What you mean? Build it and they're going to come. Mm. I love that. I love that. Yeah. You're worrying about the wrong thing. Write it. Finish it. Make it your masterpiece. And then you worry about where to place it. I get that question all the time. Where's kicking the doors going? I don't know where it's going to land. I'm waiting too. You waiting. Aren't you the one? Yeah. I want to see what God want me to put it at. And they be so messed up in the head. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? It's not my it's not my job to know that. My job is to write it, film it, edit it, pour from my heart, give me what I got, the best of Teresa Davis. And if people are not satisfied with it or don't like it, I won't feel a thing because I know I gave my all. I put every fiber into me into this movie. I don't have a social life. It may look like it on my page, but I'm out working. I'm having fun with people I work with. I don't have a I, I'm not I'm not dating. I'm not married. I'm divorced and I'm just working and I'm having fun. Those things are coming. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to throw out a few names uh, for you. You kind of tell me um, your, your thoughts. Be more careful. Uh -huh. Um, you want me to throw back a thought? Yeah, throw back your thoughts. Be be more careful. I I just said this the other night. I was happy for this person. Happy for Shannon Holmes. That's his name. He wrote a spectacular book. And it was like one of the first, in that group of first books I read, Donald Goins, uh, Iceberg Slim, Be More Careful. They were my urban books. And, um, to see it come to life, I'm still happy to be a part. I never would have thought in my in my 55 years that I would be a part of this movie in any kind of way. And to see it come to fruition for him and to come to fruition for people who I casted, I um 
I'm just I'm just happy for him. I I like how it turned out. And of course, we all have mistakes. He, you know, he's like, I have some mistakes. I was like, who don't? Who won't? Who does it? We're going to all have mistakes. Did we do our best body of work? Did you do your best body of work? That's all that matters. And I love the movie. I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We own the city. Oh, man. Oh, we own the city. I had a great time um, working on that. Um, being background was fun for me. A lot of people um, was wondering what I was doing there. Don't you do movies? Don't you do film? Don't ever feel that way. Background is where it all starts, and it's going to be where it ends. Ne background never goes away. It's uh, where you learn. It's where you, it's where you, you, you peel back the layers, and you get to watch the people who know what they're doing do, and and then you get to. I did what I call a mental report card with mm -hmm. uh, We Own the City. My mental report card. Am I doing this? Am I doing that? Do I do this? Do I check that? Am I getting these angles? And I I did a pretty good job on my, my report card too. And I was like, oh, so that made me feel a lot more confident in what I was doing because I'm already doing a lot of things I saw those people do. Mm. I do that. I do that. Oh my God. Oh, I could do that. That's a that's the way you tilt the lens into that angle. Oh, I could do that. And I I'm sitting here with a report card. I'm just checking it off mentally, quietly to myself. And this one girl walks up to me. I will never forget this. These are things that happened that are pivotal to me. And she was an extra for me. Young lady was. And um, she remembered me. She said, what are you doing here? She didn't speak. This is all she said. This is a cadence. What are you doing here? And I just look like, um, same thing you are. We're in holding. There's a place called holding. And um, for all the extras and whoever's acting, certain holdings for different things. And so we're in holding. So I'm in holding with you. I'm, I'm waiting to act. I'm waiting to... Do whatever, whatever happens today. Because I don't look at life as being an extra or background. I tell people, anybody listening to this when they watch it, they're going to say, oh, yeah, she says it all the time. You show up and amazing things will happen. When I showed up to my grandson's graduation, I wouldn't miss it for the world. I asked God to let me be there. When I showed up, amazing things happened. I watched my son walk down the aisle to sit next to me to wait for his son to walk down the aisle to walk by. I watched his, his wife. She stayed there with her camera waiting. And then I watched the guest speaker speak life. So amazing things happen. Then I met you. And now I'm talking to you. So mm. you show up and amazing things happen. Never plan a day. Just show up. And so I showed up and she she was like, I don't know if she was appalled, but she was shocked. And there was a little disdain. What are you doing here? Like, what is going on? Aren't you a filmmaker? I'm an independent filmmaker. I'm learning something every day. I am learning something. I do I do one-on-one -on -one classes at night when I go to bed. YouTube is free. I call it YouTube University. I mm. read. Yeah, and I work with other directors and we, we exchange. If you're working with someone, you can't exchange. You can't pour into one another and you need to get away from that person. You can't be the one who knows everything. You have to be able to exchange, elevate. And so when I got there, I was supposed to be a police sitting in the background. And I showed up and amazing things did happen. Um, John Bernthal, he, he's the one played on Walking Dead and in several mm -hmm. other movies. You know who I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. He was um, in the scene. Well, I was in the scene with him. And I'm just supposed to be in the background sitting there. And when we struck up a conversation, I was talking to him. I said, you got any more bubble gum? I never forget this story. <laughs> he was like, yeah, I got some more bubble gum. I said, give me some bubble gum, please. He started laughing. He gave me some bubble gum. He's like, what's your name? I said Teresa Davis. He was like, Did you say the whole government? Said, That's my name. You asked me my name, John Burrow. And he just started laughing. And we just started joking and laughing. He said, You from Baltimore? I said, Bebo, baby. Because I represent Bebo. I don't care where I am. I don't care who likes it, who don't. You know, I notice a lot of celebrities don't like to say they're from here. I don't know why, but that's the thing of their own thing. And I like to say where I'm from. And so he was like, Well, I want you to do this in the movie, Teresa Davis. I said, What you want me to do? I said, Hold up. I look toward the director because I respect directors because I'm trying to be the best one I can be. And I'm like, hold up. I know you, you, you're a big principal in this movie, but hold up. My mind is saying the director right there. So I looked at um, Renato Green. That's the director, Mr. Green. He's awesome. Um, he did the movie with Serena Sisters. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Yeah, I looked at him and he looked at me like, yeah, see what he wants. See, see he, wants. he didn't say it, but it's uh, that's it. So I said, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to walk through with me and I want you to, I want you to get smart with me and I'm going to get smart with you. So I was like, let's go from extra to speaking. This ain't, this, okay. I'm saying this to myself. Mm. And so we do it. And so then that's when Mr. Ronaldo says, uh, do it again. Uh, cut, I want you to do it again. But then I want you to, to not talk. Because, you know, I realize I, I can't talk. It has to be um, already on paperwork for the, um, for your social number, social security number, all those good things, uh, you know, when you're in the system already. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, so, because they get paid much more to talk. So I'm like, okay. So he said, I just want you to laugh. Or I want you to gesture. So that was like highlight for me because I knew what he wanted. I realized he knew, oh, wait a minute. That's a good idea. We can't do it. And, and so, and it was nice. We did it. I laughed. And you see that scene when you come out of the courtroom and I'm like, yeah, and I'm laughing at him. And then um, he's he's blowing his bubble, whatever, have he's chewing his gum. And that was awesome for me because you show up and amazing things that happen. You go from being an extra to standing next to the leading role talking. He's talking. But um, I'll never forget the first take. It was my first take and he did it over. You know, the laughter was fun, leaving out laughter. And it was a definitely a good experience for me. So shout out to Thea Washington and um, oh, my boy um, Bird from uh, Bird House Studios. He was there at the studio at the end. Uh, at the uh, end. So I, I like the concept, uh, Teresa, of just showing up and amazing things um, can happen. I'll say this, we're close to the end. And, you know, a lot of these podcasts, you'll see them all over social media. They have like this top five, right? The top five this or the top five that. Being as though that you are a film director, a five-time author, a visionary, somebody that's well-trained in the arts, um, a beautiful soul. And one of the things I can say most importantly is you are a proud Baltimorean. Let's go with your top five pieces of art that was produced here in Baltimore, whether it was a book, film, or movie, album. Go. What are your top five? Um, let's see. My top five pieces of work, right? Yep. That I've done. Mm. Well, I liked when I was on For My Man. That was one because being that was one of my favorite shows. For my man, and to actually be on there acting and had a speaking role, I was like, I'm all for my man. I watched it a lot. Um, another show, um, when I anchored Channel Two for a while, that was fun. Mm. I never thought I would be on Channel Two. I'm sorry, it's not in my bio. <laughs> I'm sorry, but no. that was one of them. That was one of them. Um, directing my son in this movie, Kicking Indoors. He has one of the principals. He worked for that. He's been in like 10 movies. They're not all mine, but he worked for it. And he'll tell you she's so hard on me. She's as hard as on me than anybody ever met her. Well, I'm supposed to be as my son. Mm -hmm. So he finally has a really huge principal. I'm very, very proud of my son, Stephen Kelly Jr., for uh, having this role in that movie, Kicking Indoors, um, having the entire city, um, all the actors and all of the artists, the rappers and the talented people that some of the actors aren't actors that I, I've kind of let them know, you know, you can act and they, they've honed into it. Some of the rappers are now actors. They never act in their life. So that's one of the big things for me. And then there's another movie Percocet that I did. It's not out yet. And I'm, I'm kind of holding that dear. I don't know exactly when I'm going to bring it out, but I still have the project. And there were a lot of people from Baltimore and Percocet. And that was about a lot of um, the Percocet use here in Baltimore. So that was one big one for me. And I, I lost count, but my books, of course. Ghetto gotcha. Mission Untied. Gotcha. So before we end, tell people, number one, how Kicking Indoors is one of your newer projects, how they can have access to that. Um, be more careful. Tell people how they can get access to, to watch that. And then also, how can people follow you on all forms of social media so they can be abreast of all the positive things that you are doing? Okay. For Kicking Indoors, you can go to Teresa Davis, all platforms, Facebook, Instagram. It's going to be T-E-R-E-S-A Davis. And on that's Facebook. And on Instagram, it's two underscores, Teresa Davis, and two underscores at the end. Just go follow me on Instagram. I do follow back. Um, and you can catch up with everything that we're doing and when things are coming out. Um, also, with uh, there's another movie I'm doing. I didn't get a chance to talk about. It's called Affiliated. And that is about gang members. Um, I am the co-director. I work with Ray Luger on it. 
Um, there are a lot of people in Baltimore in that movie too, where we're nearing closing time. We got like a good, um, we're midway there where we are. And um, it's about Baltimore and Ray Luger wrote the story. He asked me 10 years ago to, to, to be a part of it. And now the 10 years have came. So we're, we're doing the movie now with Feminine Hand Baltimore, as I still work with, work on kicking indoors and the movie is about gang awareness is about how children are being manipulated into gangs and a lot of parents don't know the signs and we we show you through art like I said again so I was I was full on for that because I like those kind of stories I like to be able to educate and so and you can check out um be more careful on your apple um tv and also prime video I uh, did the casting uh, mainly for baltimore and I also have um, a couple roles on there. I played two roles. Um, and my son plays on it and a lot of actors. And a lot of Baltimore. And shout out to Baltimore. They did a great job in that movie. So you can look at that on your Apple and your Prime. Got you. Listen, I think if there's any one way that we can uh, end this show, Teresa, I, I love your quote. Show up and amazing things will happen. So you showed up today. You are <laughs> who uh, shared with the listeners, people that met me at happy hour with some amazing information. Um, and like I said, this will be available for everybody that's listening. By the time they hear this, it will be available Friday on YouTube and Spotify. So Teresa, thank you so much for meeting me at happy hour. Thank you. And thank you for having me, Rashad. And I want to say to you, that you, you are awesome. I thank love you. Appreciate all, it. Your, all your slips you put up. When you put them up, they're so refreshing and uplifting. I appreciate you for that. Thank, thank you so you. much. Appreciate it. Have a great one. You too. And bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Awesome. <laughs>